All right, welcome everyone to our next talk. I'd like to welcome Barton Rhodes on securing your Kubeflow clusters. Everybody, please give him a round of applause. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll um, talk to you a bit about Kubeflow and uh, Kubernetes and um, you know, uh, how, to, how to get it um, set up in a way that is not going to compromise your data. So first of all, what is Kubeflow? Um, Kubeflow is a set of um, open source components that are running on Kubernetes and are designed for end-to-end -end deployments of uh, your machine learning models. So uh, you may have seen this um, quote uh, or heard it on a recent podcast. Uh, it's a quote by Ian Coldwater. Uh, she said that containers are only as secure as their runtimes and their orchestration frameworks and their kernels and their operating systems and everything else. So. This is not a talk about um, Kubernetes security per se, or um, container security, and there are plenty of excellent venues and talks um, at cons right, right now where you can go and learn about these things. Um, what I wanted to uh, do, uh, rather than go into detail on that, is to introduce you to Kubeflow, um, let you know that it exists, um, and help you uh, get started with it in a way that um, will give, give you some secure defaults and uh, will allow you to prevent data exfiltration and um, help you to understand a little bit about the security model of Kubeflow and uh, point you at resources that you can uh, use to learn more about uh, the underlying stack. So um, this may not be new to most of you. Uh, I think originally I saw this chart at um, in the paper by, uh, called the Hidden Technical Debt Machine Learning. So the actual machine learning code, the training code that you use to run your model is only a small portion of um, most of the things that go into making a successful deployment of a machine learning project. Um, you know, it, it, in, many time, in many cases, um, the hard part begins once you have illustrated the value of the project once you've shown that it works on your test data set and you are asked to integrate it. And this, this is not a skill set that a lot of people coming from statistics or data science are equipped with. Obviously, people in this room are um, a, diff a slightly different mix from a typical data science environment, but that's um, effectively the goal of the project is to find open source components, existing uh, uh, cloud native technologies for every step of the way in deploying the model, starting with data pre-processing in a consistent manner to um, training your model to actually um, tuning your hyperparameters, keeping track of your experiments and metadata associated with actual uh, model training. So um, it's also a nice um, way of um, making data scientists comfortable with uh, a number of Kubernetes concepts. Arguably, uh, Kubernetes is not the right level of abstraction for a lot of us to understand. Um, you know, the data science um, people and um, analysts uh, understand uh, the infrastructure that we consume. Um, typically, we just want to have compute. We want to be able to um, run our models uh, within a certain amount of time. We want to be able to migrate our workloads between different uh, deployment um, environments. And uh, you know, we want to do it uh, in a matter that's familiar to us and using the tools that are um, commonly used by us every day. And so that's the why of it. So, um, Kubeflow, um, like I said, reuses open source components and it is uh, designed to um, give you a sane defaults and integration pieces for um, every um, uh, likely aspect of what you use. And so here is an example of uh, one of the possible deployment scenarios where as a data scientist, you may start in Jupyter Notebook, which is a natural environment uh, for um, a lot of data scientists, and then have the same workflow, uh, workload um, that you run uh, for training and prediction in um, in the cloud, uh, and as well, including a managed service like AI platform, and uh, um, run it on premise and basically anywhere Kubernetes runs. So that's that's the goal. Um, in order to accomplish this goal, um, you know, this is a very young project, and so um, uh, my background to coming into it is I am deploying this in a healthcare setting where um, you know you may have uh, considerations of cost, considerations of data locality. Um, you need to have um, sort of building blocks that are uh, stackable um, by data scientists. And so one of these, these building blocks is a project, um, sub-project of Kubeflow called Fairing. Uh, so by, by um, to introduce you to this, I would like to sort of um, point you to a series of blog posts by Netflix and sort of it's uh, trying to bring the Netflix model of notebook deployments to an open source project where um, 
a lot of not just data exploration, but uh, you know, or model training or model inferencing happens uh, inside of the notebook, but also the data engineering tasks and tasks are, that are repeatable. Um, and then there's a library called Papermill that uh, Faring integrates. So uh, Faring allows you to ask a, a question: Can we? how much of the uh, actual workflow can we make reproducible uh, directly from the Jupyter notebook? And so this may sound crazy, but if you think about um, you know, typical workloads that you encounter in large projects, uh, the actual execution of your IPython kernel and things like that is, is, is a minor part of that. So computationally, that's not a uh, hard constraint and um, fairing is the project that allows you to do that. So. Um, to illustrate the benefits of fairing SDK, which is a Python SDK, um, um, you can see the current approach to uh, deployments um, that are local, so it may work in your preferred environment, not necessarily a notebook. You know, fairing is equally usable from your favorite IDE. Um, you then would have to adapt it to some deployment surface, like it's a platform or you know, uh, actual um, managed service of some kind or your own API uh, endpoint that you build. And then um, it, the way to deploy it in Kubeflow is through consuming right now is to consuming the TF job uh, type uh, deployments. And so that's that's um, a lot of modification and refactoring and every step where your target deployment and your local deployment differ um, introduces potential for uh, bugs to creep in. So uh, with fairing, uh, you can have a um, fairly simple way of migrating your workloads by um, abstracting away the back end and the deployment procedure for your model. So um, that's one of the ways that Kubeflow allows you to um, benefit from um, code reuse. And uh, you can um, transition the environments um, pretty seamlessly by just swapping out um, whichever Kubeflow config that you have. So you can target the cluster that's uh, you know isolated. Uh, healthcare class cluster that has patient data, you can um, target GKE and so pretty much any any scenario where um, you would have Kubernetes can be easily addressed, including local environments. So if you're used to developing locally with uh, a Minikube, if you were exposed to that, you don't have to change a lot of the templates that um, um, you work with in the cloud to be able to execute it. Um, so here's where it gets into security. So like um, all of these niceties are nice to have, but you know it's uh, very um, very important that we understand the um, security model and different permissions and uh, exposure that you get by using these services. So once again, my goal is to inform you uh, as to where we are today and give you an uh, an idea as to what is affected by permissions that you have and uh, sort of put it in front of you and let you let you examine it and you know understand the different um, approaches. So as, as a part of the um, Jupyter Notebook service that uh, comes into uh, Kubeflow, you get access to a variety of Kubernetes resources. So you can uh, schedule pods, uh, create deployment services, uh, in including training jobs and inference jobs and PyTorch, TensorFlow, and you know other frameworks are being added um, all the time. So um, you can create this directly from your notebook. And uh, you can, you can once again, um, have that as a repeatable step in your um, ML, MLOps workflow. Um, that's the blog post that actually goes into it. So the, the end result of this is to be able to, uh, instead of making every deployment a one-off deployment, where um, you know majority of uh, data science projects actually end up uh, not realizing their um, investment, um, you want to be able to um, have something that's automated and repeatable, and so that's that's the Netflix model that Faring enables. So um, you can find the Faring SDK on GitHub, and um, the scenarios in which you use it is through consumption by the notebook and um, some sort of um, environment where you can use Python. So you can, you can imagine some uh, an Airflow. Um, a trigger, it can be any variety of um, different scenarios where the workflow needs to be automated. However, you get to a point where you know you want to be able to have a more um, defined workflow. Let's say you have deployed it, you've exposed your endpoint. So typically, uh, the end result of the fairing workflow is some sort of an endpoint where you have um, the ability to uh, pass it on to your um, UI team, for instance, to build a simple UI around it. 
or you have um, some other downstream service consuming it. So that's um, that's as far as uh, fairing gets you, and you can get that from the notebook or from repeatable process. But what if you have a complex um, end-to-end process that uh, um, requires a lot of many different steps that fail, and you want to isolate each of those steps and uh, control um, the security permission model on each individual part of the DAG. So um, that's where Kubeflow Pipelines comes in. So Pipelines is a different component I wanted to introduce you to before we um, jump into what you can do to make these deployments secure. Uh, it's a UI for managing experiments, jobs, and runs. So it's um, also an SDK uh, that uh, effectively allows you to break down your um, entire end-to-end -end workflow uh, into a number of containerized operations. Uh, so uh, instead of thinking in terms of an um, entire function that does a number of different things uh, from data pre-processing to outlier removal to training and then tuning, you, s and you can imagine your scenario. Um, you, you isolate each component of that workflow into um, its own component and uh, you have the Docker image or some uh, that captures the requirements of your model uh, in one place and um, you then... Um, you can add things like monitoring uh, to it, and you all you have to do is to um, follow a number of standard interfaces that are defined in the container op spec. So the benefit of that is to be able to uh, not only um, get performance out of your models uh, by uh, addressing bottlenecks, but you can also freeze uh, a version of your model in time by, by looking at the exact image that was used to run at every any given step of the model. So if, if your goal is reproducibility, which I think it should be, uh, you can um, get back to the exact versions of containers that were used to run your model. So um, visualization of the DAG might look like this. So that's an example of the XG boost run that you can find um, in the docs. So um, as you can see, the operations here are not limited to just the um, ML tasks, like you know training and transformation of the data, but things like creating clusters. And if you uh, go a few slides back, we can find that uh, we have access to pods, deployment services, and jobs. So you can, you can um, not only do the modeling, but everything required for it in terms of infrastructure and uh, service uh, requirements that are needed, and then introduce monitoring and uh, outputs in the inter intermediate steps. So one of the things you could do is uh, visualize the HTML output of the Jupyter Notebook that gives you some reference metrics for how well your model is doing, or visualize a confusion matrix or an ROC curve, something that will give you um, a way of visually debugging it, which is one more place where the notebooks sort of make an appearance. You can take the same fairy notebooks that you use for analysis and uh, integrate them into these intermediate steps as a form of like debugging, uh, debugging intermediate steps. Uh, this is a diagram of the um, what happens behind the scenes as far as uh, allowing it to happen. So if uh, you actually look at the way pipelines are implemented, there are, there are Argo workflows with a very thin sort of layer that makes it uh, uh, adaptable to Kubeflow pipelines. But if you are familiar with Argo, everything that Argo normally gets you, which is event-driven um, workloads, isolation of individual steps, um, and you, you, you get with it. And so uh, in, in, in the recent version that just came out, 0.6, you actually have the metadata store. So every run of a Kubeflow pipeline is uh, versioned, and uh, the, the information about it is stored into a metadata database, which is a MySQL database with uh, a JSON schema uh, that uh, allows you to track artifacts. The artifacts are pipelines or individual container operations in the pipeline. So once again, it's a lot of... Um, opportunity to uh, mess up and expose uh, some part of the um, architecture to the outside world. So it's um, imperative that we um, talk more about how we, how we, how we isolate that. Um, and um, as you can see, the, um, the, the entire architecture is quite complex. So uh, this talks a little bit about about the domain specific language that uh, Kubeflow Pipelines gives you. So you have container ops, pipeline parameters, components. Uh, there are a number of standard components that uh, come with pre-built uh, containers and uh, um, images that allow you to run simple Python functions that don't require a lot of dependencies. There are um, operations that allow you to handle volumes. So you can actually create a data, data store that's needed for your 
uh, storage of intermediate artifacts like uh, weights on your model or some debugging outputs. And um, this is an example of a specification like a lot of things in Kubernetes world, you, you define it using YAML. So um, as long as you are consistent in what inputs, outputs, uh, each individual step takes, so you can attach an image uh, to it, and you can actually run a train command that, um, my, or any other sort of entry point uh, that will take arguments and allow you to execute a specific, uh, specific, specific workload in a specific manner with um, a number of arguments that will power it. What what does it get us? You know, like uh, just take a step back from the concrete, uh, like detail of the, over there. It's uh, it's it's it gets us a, a standard reusable component. Uh, structure that allows us to take our work and uh, be able to take it with us or uh, generalize it to uh, problems that um, we might encounter down the line. So instead of learning a specific stack at uh, you know one of the big four, we can actually go ahead and uh, build in a manner that um, is shareable and is available to um, uh, to be executed anywhere Kubernetes runs. So as a Google project, it initially had more contributors from Google. Uh, it recently passed the point where majority of contributors actually come from the community. Uh, the David Aronchik, the person who started um, as a PM of the project with Google is now at Microsoft and bringing it to Azure. So it's got a broad support by, um, by the community and um, it's a community driven project. Um, in the future, you can imagine individual pieces of the, your pipelines becoming uh, shared with um, others in in in, uh, in a reusable manner. So, um, so that's that's it about Kubeflow. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction. There is a lot more to it, and that's just scratching a surface by looking at these two components that um, get you from notebook interface to something that's event driven and uh, triggerable and reusable. So, I want to talk about benefits of uh, this approach and how we think about security in Kubeflow. So um, principle of least privilege, I think, is a benefit not just for this project, but uh, Kubernetes in general. And then the, the, it's a good argument for running things in containers in the first place, instead of having one um, service account with access to you know everything in your infrastructure, you can isolate your workloads by uh, specific tasks that are, that are needed to perform. Uh, so in this case, you can think about a container operation that uh, needs to read data from a Google Cloud storage bucket. Uh, the, the service accounts, the secrets that you expose to that uh, container uh, do not need to have anything beyond that. And if there is a vulnerability in some component of that container or if the container gets compromised, uh, you don't lose access to the entire infrastructure. And so. Um, once again, to inform you what is happening now, and uh, for, for for context, a lot of this is still not like GA or it's not at 1.0 version, so it's uh, the latest stable version is 0.6. Um, security tends to take a backseat when rapid development is uh, a goal, and so right now is the time to start thinking about how can we improve this. And so, uh, my goal is to, by informing you, let you get to the GitHub, play with the code see what you can do, see how, how you can break it, and uh, you know, hopefully open some issues and pull requests to, uh, to, to help us do better. So uh, in that, from that perspective, I will um, introduce you to the three service accounts that, and permissions that, uh, so that are uh, currently deployed with them. So we have, um, uh, and a lot of this maps into the on-premise deployment, but of necessity, uh, Google Cloud Platform has been more of a stable target for Kubeflow as of now. So if you're dealing in the, on-premise environment, I think things like IAM roles I'll be describing now, they're more specific to um, Google Cloud Platform and won't translate as easily to your um, on-premise role-based authentication. So uh, one service account is uh, admin, and it's used to um, actually deploy and configure uh, the cluster. Uh, so you can find the uh, KFCTL um, script that is going to use the admin service account to perform most of the deployments. Uh, user is uh, what most data scientists will encounter uh, in their day-to-day. -day. So that, that allows you to use and consume GCP resources and interact with GCP resources from your container operations or fairing if you're using a Jupyter notebook. And um, we have uh, the logging account as well, which uses VM, uh, which is called VM, and it's, it's, using, it's used to take audit logs and send them to Stackdriver. So uh, as far as concrete roles, uh, 
for the account. And all of these can be adjusted, by the way. So this is uh, taken directly from a Cloud Deployment Manager template that you can find in the repository. Uh, the admin service account has source admin, which is uh, allowing you to push the application to Cloud Repository. Uh, it has the management account, which uh, allows you to control the endpoints and the host names of those endpoints. Uh, network admin uh, is used to enable identity aware proxy, which allows you to uh, use your Google account to authenticate against different resources and get uh, and consume them, as well as health checks. So that's that's the admin account. If you wanted to change these, you would add things to the template, but you know that would be specific to your organization's security policy. Uh, the user service account it allows you to uh, do things like. Uh, build uh, custom uh, things on Container Builder. Um, that's important if you want to run um, your application in the context where you don't have access to GCR, uh, Google Container Registry. And so uh, you, the builder allows you to actually package it up uh, as a coherent sort of um, end-to-end -end application and uh, you know, deploy it um, potentially in an air-gap environment, which could be a concern for security. Uh, you can have a viewer role uh, for actually viewing the resources of the builds. And then you, uh, this is just an example, you know, your services may vary. So for instance, you want to add data proc or something. This is not currently captured here, but this is a minimal set of permissions for interacting with cloud storage buckets, BigQuery and Dataflow, uh, which uh, all of which will probably help you with uh, data. So. Um, and then, of course, the monitoring account, uh, log writer, metric writer, and object viewer. So these are these are the roles that you can review with and uh, you know decide whether they're appropriate or not. One of, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned in the earlier slide is an IAP account. So this actually uh, goes to your uh, user account that authenticates against uh, identityware proxy. So you have to be able to have uh, an object viewer role on that. So uh, that is a part of the implementation. And then VM service account, like I said, has log writer and all that. So okay, so that's um, that's based on um, um, Kubeflow's built-in roles right now. Um, um, what the way you will control the um, the way that it relates to uh, role-based authentication in Kubernetes is it it, it, it complements it. So when you are trying to um, define that, I am can only get you so far, and it's probably better for metadata and access to other objects. Uh, that um, are accessible through IAM and control through IAM roles. If you wanted to actually interact with Kubernetes uh, permissions that themselves, you could create other objects like cluster roles and cluster role bindings that um, will help you control the management of your resources um, using the Kubernetes model. So that, once again, I point you to the resources towards the end where this can be addressed in, in more detail. Um, so um, this is a brief description of how that works. Uh, and uh, uh, just to clarify, as one, one thing is that uh, in point six, we now have per user um, namespace isolation. So if you start with a um, new project and you add your own user, all of your pods, notebook services, endpoints that you deploy will be contained to that namespace. And so other data scientists or other teams um, may not necessarily have access to your namespace. So that buys you uh, multi-tenancy uh, and things like that. So it's it's important, to, for instance, if you are in a context where certain projects require a separate set of NDAs or uh, have some PII that may, should not be accessible outside of very particular analysis. Um, okay, so um, the gist of this talk is actually quite simple. There are two main things you can do as a data scientist when deploying this. My, my, my goal is for you to go back to your place of employment and uh, try this. You know, And I, when you try it, I don't want you to uh, uh, add cryptocurrency miners to your, to your company's infrastructure. So um, a few simple precautions can uh, help, you, help you avoid that. So uh, the main one, honestly, is the VPC service control um, idea. So what that allows you to do is to restrict access to certain API endpoints uh, that will be consumed by your application to only the um, um, services and pods that come from within uh, within your Kubeflow deployment. Uh, VPC service control model um, gives you the secure perimeter within which um, only the um, uh, the clients that are authorized can have private access to resources, create them, copy them, and so 
to be clear, this only applies to the content within those resources, not the metadata about those resources. If you wanted to manage the metadata, you would have to fall back on the IAM models. So if you're trying to uh, copy things from Google Cloud Storage or um, do things in BigQuery, um, if you want to make sure that um, you know your, your team in, in a different uh, geographic lo locale will not have uh, the same access, you just use VPC service controls to isolate them. So um, these are some of the benefits that allow you to, that I could go into more detail on if uh, there are any questions, but uh, effectively um, it's it's um, configurable uh, using standard OAuth credentials. Uh, you have uh, ability to restrict it by ser per service. And um, here's an example of how you would do that. And of course, all of these environment variables actually have to be set. Uh, but this is the command line approach, in which case you uh, enable the uh, resource manager API and, DN uh, and the other prerequisite steps. There is a similar way to defining a secure perimeter in the UI in GCP. Once again, this would be different on your um, actual on-premise deployment, but you could say that um, your application should only be able to access PubSub or storage API and should not be able to access Bigtable or you know other, other services within the perimeter. And you can restrict it to specific projects which in uh, GCP land have come with their own set of isolations. So when you're um, setting it up and trying to justify it to your boss, so just ma make sure to say that you will not have uh, issues with like some high, high security service, like let's say BigQuery has all of your critical data. Um, Another thing you can do, and uh, I recommend doing this, especially if you're exposing uh, any any resources uh, that uh, uh, have have a load balancer in front of them, restricted by uh, authorized networks by using a specific IP range that you'll be heading them from. So it's uh, something that uh, can save you from unfortunate uh, unfortunate outcomes. Um, here is another command line example of what you saw earlier uh, in the UI. So in this case, you once again define a secure perimeter, but that's uh, that's something that you can automate for creation of new projects, either with uh, Cloud Deployment Manager Terraform or other tool like that. Just don't don't make it a guesswork every time um, and try to uh, try to, um, you know, fall back on good practices and discuss it with your team and understand like what, what is within your uh, security. Uh, budget so effectively we have uh different different apis here in this case we're enabling bigquery container registry and storage but uh you know your your, your use case may vary and so i've added some diagrams in case you wanted to see um practically what this gives you so once you have a cer certain service perimeter uh that allows you, within which you run kubeflow uh you will not have to worry about unauthorized access from outside world or other clients that will um consume it in ways that you didn't intend. This is the case for cloud. The on-premise situation is a little bit more complicated, especially with uh, GKE on-prem and Anthos. Uh, um, you know, you can have these things uh, a bit more configured, but uh, once again, this has been mostly GCP focused. In this case, uh, you can extend your VPC uh, perimeter into a uh, on-premise network by using some sort of a VPN gateway that uh, could come with its own uh, sub subnet and uh, by defining strict uh, firewall rules bet how, between for how different uh, VPCs talk to each other, you can prevent that from happening. Honestly, um, if you get to this point, you should probably work with your um, uh, operations as DLC teams, but as, as, as a one-off experiment, I recommend just trying on GCP and um, configuring very basic service perimeter like so. Um, um, one last step, a uh, thing it may seem obvious, but uh, one of the most common ways GCP accounts get compromised is uh, service account uh, leakage. It's you know, either somebody commits to GitHub or you know something silly like that can happen, especially for um, newer data analysts, data scientists. A lot of the tutorials advise you to add everything in your directory to Git and commit it. So uh, that's how a lot of that stuff happens. So true story. Uh, luckily, Kubernetes allows you to store credentials in a secure manner that can be accessed from a variety of places in Kubeflow um, infrastructure. And I wanted to show you how to go through that really briefly. So you can add a secret by uh, using standard secret uh, creation interface. Your secret can be your service account. It could be JSON. It could be environment variable that you set. I recommend using secrets uh, for anything JSON or even the passwords that you want to consume later. 
Um, you can spread the uh, credentials to your entire uh, infrastructure by using Google Application Credentials, which is your environment variable that stores your um, service account files, and that every pod that will start with a certain s service account uh, with, within, within your cluster will have access to those resources. Let's say there is something every pod, ha pod has to hit. Um, once again, per namespace, um, so you don't have to worry about it leaking to your colleagues. Um, you can authenticate from the pod directly by, uh, you know, picking it up from a secret store and m mounting a GCP secret as a volume. Uh, once again, this environment variable is how your SDK will know what uh, to authenticate with. Uh, you can access secrets from a pipeline. So if you remember the components earlier, the, it's part of the DSL to be able to include uh, a specific secret, secret into your pipeline. So think of this as a um, critical step. So it's, it may be very tempting to add your secret to, to, to your Docker image if you're on a deadline, but if you uh, if you just follow these simple procedures and you add secrets uh, by using the DSL directly, you're preventing um, you know unnecessary harm um, from leaking your uh, service accounts to your um, registry. Uh, lastly, I had a little bit of material on the 0.6 edition, which just which just happened. Uh, what big migration from 0.5 was the replacement of Ambassador Proxy with the Istio gateway. And um, at this point, uh, it may not be as relevant to day-to-day -day use by a data scientist, but Istio comes with a number of very nice uh, ways of controlling uh, flow of data and security between different uh, services uh, in your in your cluster and so you get a lot of things for free like auth uh, auth c authentication authorization um, and um, things like um, fault injections uh, which allow you to test uh, your uh, your model and so i'll wrap, wrap up real quick but i uh, wanted to uh, point you to some resources and references. So kubeflow.org is great. There are private clusters uh, description over there. And a lot of this material is, came from uh, kubeflow documentation and as well as the blog post by Ericto, which did a really good write-up on authentication. And please join our Slack. Uh, start contributing. We need security people to look at this before it hits 1.0 so that we don't have nasty surprises down the line. Uh, and thank you. You can find me on Twitter, Keybase, GitHub, uh, or feel free to email me directly. Thank <laughs> you.